Marissa, uh, it, our you guys fellow is going to uh, dazzle us with a little news. Good morning. So I'll be covering more than you ever wanted to know about dots and spots in the retina, and we'll start with the case. So this is a 38-year-old healthy Caucasian female that came in complaining of gray spots in the vision of her left eye starting three days before, accompanied by some intermittent flashes and shimmering of the vision of her left eye. She was a fairly high myo, <coughs> no past medical history, but she did have several um, first-degree relatives with autoimmune disorders. And she was a physician, but otherwise unremarkable social history. On presentation of the uveitis clinic, vision in the right eye was 20-20, left eye was 20-50. She was seen a few days before on call, and the left um, vision was 20-30 at that time, so it had declined a little bit in the past few days. Vision, um, or sorry, pupils and pressures were normal. Anterior segment was unremarkable. She was noted to have rare vitreous cell in the left eye, but no haze. Fundus photo of the right eye, a little bit of myopic changes, but otherwise unremarkable. And fundus photo of the left eye showing some punctate, whitish yellow lesions in the posterior pole. So the differential at this point, just based on the fundus appearance, is still quite broad. We don't know what the course of the disease is. Is it going to occur in the other eye? If there's any systemic involvement or if she has any infectious exposures. So at this point, there's autoimmune or inflammatory conditions, always think about infectious disorders. And we're going to use multimodal imaging to further characterize this condition. This is fundus autofluorescence, so we can see hyperautofluorescence in the peripapillary region with some punctate appearance extending beyond. OCT through the fovea shows some hyperreflective material at the ellipsoid zone subfovially with protruding into the middle layers of the retina. And also towards the left of this image, which is nasally, there's a more diffuse disruption of the ellipsoid zone. And then OCT, just superior to the fovea, there's more irregularity of the photoreceptors. This is early fluorescein angiography at about 30 seconds, and we can start to see some hyperfluorescence in the peripapillary region, which becomes more intense in the later frames. And then if we zoom in on one area, and I apologize because the image quality degrades, but you can imagine that the hyperfluorescence is in sort of a ring-shaped pattern right here. This is mid-phase ICG, and there's some hypocyanescent lesions in the posterior pole, but not too remarkable. But then late ICG, many more hypocyanescent lesions clustered around the the nerve, which is um, many more than we saw on exam or on fluorescein angiography. So we tested for all the usual suspects and that was unrevealing. We did start oral steroids in this patient since she had a little bit of decline in vision since the initial presentation. And she was already on Valtrex TID <coughs> when she got to us. Um, there's some anecdotal reports in the literature of the rapid response of vision after starting antivirals and the azor-like illnesses. Continued that. Two weeks later, uh, she had an entirely sort of resolution of those lesions that we saw in the posterior pole. One may say that the lesions were evanescent. <laughs> Vision at that time was 20 30, um, but her um, autofluorescence was still markedly abnormal, actually, a little worse. She had some restoration of her ISOS junction, but not completely back to. So based on the clinical course and the appearance, we feel this is a pretty classic case of multiple evanescent white dot syndrome or MUDES. And this was first described by Lee Jampol in the 1980s. He had 11 young female patients that had um, transient vision loss in one eye with some white dots in the fundus and they recovered without treatment. As Dr. Vitali mentioned, the exact etiology of these white dot syndromes is unknown, but there's some suggestion of an infectious etiology, about half the patients to have a viral prodrome they may be exposed to an exogenous agent that then stimulates an inflammatory response. Um, and as mentioned, there's a higher prevalence of autoimmune disorders in patients and their first degree relatives, suggesting an inherited immune dysregulation. Average age is 28 years, there's a female predominance and it does occur in all races. So clinically, patients complain about blurred vision, so photopsias or shimmering of a vision and floaters, usually in just one eye. Um, they may have a viral prodrome, 
on exam, we see these small yellow whitish 100 to 200 micron lesions um, with slightly indistinct borders that are clustered in the perifovial region and around the optic nerve, but typically sparing the direct fovea. Um, and each dot is composed of many smaller dots. Macular or foveal granularity is a hallmark of this disease. And you can have a little bit of anterior chamber reaction um, and a mild vitritis is seen in about 50% of patients. Optic disswelling is quite common. So it's typically thought of as unilateral and, re and non-recurrent, but there are uh, at least 22 re reported cases of bilateral involvement and more than 10 of recurrence or chronicity. So this course has, or this disease has a natural good prognosis with um, um, rest restoration of the vision back to baseline usually within four to eight weeks without treatment. And the lesions resolve um, on exam with restoration of the visual acuity. So back to the dots and spots. This is something that GAS described um, seeing on FA and ICG, there are two components that um, are seen in some but not all cases, and the dots correspond to those white spots we see in the posterior pole. These are smaller and more superficial, located in the outer nuclear layer, and then spots um, are larger and deeper in the um, ellipsoid layer. So on OCT, there's um, irregularity or debris of hyperreflective material at the ellipsoid layer corresponding to the dots. Um, kind of a buzz phrase is hyperreflective material resting on the RPE, and then the protrusions of this material in towards the middle retinal layers is responsible for the dots that we see. And here's photos describing it from the literature, seeing these protrusions up into the middle retinal layers, and here as well. And you notice that the RPE is usually intact and that the hyperreflective material is accumulating um, on top of the RPE, which distinguishes this from what we saw in Dr. Um, Choi's presentation of PIC and multifocal, where the hyperreflective material usually accumulates under the RPE. Um, there's varying reports in the literature about the fundus autofluorescence being either hyper or hypo autofluorescence for the dots and the spots seen, but in, this is a reminder of what the autofluorescence looked like in our case, so there is no hypo autofluorescence. And then fluorescein angiography, the classic teaching, or this, the early punctate hyperfluorescence that um, corresponds to a wreath-like configuration. And there's some peripapillary staining late. This is a classic photo showing the wreath-like configuration, which we could kind of see in ours as well. And then on ICG, um, late ICG, which is um, a hallmark of this, of this disease, is that there's many more hypocyanescent lesions seen on ICG than either FA or on exam and they're clustered around the posterior pole and the optic nerve corresponding to the area of visual field defect. And there's dots and spots and dots on spots. And then putting it all together, this is ONFOS OCT, comparing the lesion C on FA and ICG with the layers of the, of the retina, showing that the dots are more superficial in the outer nuclear layer and that the spots are in the ellipsoid zone. And then one of our more recent modalities of multimodal imaging is OCT angiography, importantly showing that there's a completely normal choreocapillaris and choroid in this disease in all the patients in this study. Um, so with our multimodal imaging, it may not tell us why these diseases happen, but it can tell us exactly where they're happening. So this is really a disease of the photoreceptor layers rather than the choroid. For visual field testing, we have um, enlargement of the blind spot correlating to the hypocyanus and lesions around the um, nerves seen on ICG. And the visual field defects can persist longer than the central visual acuity decline and after the lesions resolve. Um, there's many people that suggest that acute idiopathic blind spot syndrome or enlargement syndrome is really this disease or it's used as a wastebasket term for MUDES and Azor, kind of poorly understood entities that do have enlargement of the blind spot. If you get an ERG in the acute phase, which can be difficult, there are some abnormalities um, in the oscillatory potentials on full field ERG. And then multifocal ERG has been used extensively to try to map topographically the retina and the function, understanding that the multifocal ERG response is measuring the outer and middle retina and the multifocal oscillatory potentials reflect the inner retinal function. So knowing that, there's a study that showed acute ERG um, or ERG in the acute phase of MUDES. And here's a multifocal ERG that's abnormal in the left eye, which is the affected eye. And here the normal right eye. 
And then they superimposed the multifocal ERG oscillatory potentials onto the multifocal ERG, and it's showing that there's some retinal dysfunction on the oscillatory potentials, even in areas of so-called normal retina, which um, suggests that there's some inner retinal dysfunction that's preceding the outer retinal dysfunction in some areas. So back to our case, in six weeks, patient's vision was back to 20-20 in both eyes. She had a normalization of her fundus autofluorescence appearance and restoration of her ellipsoid zone. She was tapered off her steroids and did well. Questions? Question. I've always been interested in a potential um, infectious etiology for this condition. When Lee Jan Polk first reported his cases, they were all clustered in Chicago. And at the same time, we saw in the suburbs of Chicago a cluster of eight cases over less than a year. Very similar uh, findings to what he had reported initially. And then over the course of the next three years, saw like one more case. And so, and, and they all had the same pattern in that they would get the initial findings and then without treatment, they would just fade away. They had maybe a few cells in the vitreous, very vague, and they had a big blind spot and all the other findings. But, you know, was, we were always wondering if this was some kind of a post viral etiology and why would it cluster in these particular areas? It's a really good point. I still don't think we know the answer to that, and it's definitely a proposed theory. How long did you continue your patient on the antivirals? I think we stopped we him after the off. six. Yeah, after the, yeah. the four-week appointment when vision was normal. There have been some reports that antiviral therapy may be effective in ACE, which is another entity that uh, there's overlap with mutes, uh, mutes and ACE or so-called ACE or complex. But you know, that's there are only a couple of case reports. And I've actually not been too impressed. I've actually tried in patients with ASR, not been too impressed with the utility. But Don Grass is a pretty smart guy, and he postulated, you know, viral etiology to to these diseases. Um, you know, I think it's certainly uh, possible that a viral trigger uh, is responsible for this. But Gas actually felt that the virus went into the uh, photoreceptor layer and was actually primarily responsible for it. Um, the more prevailing is that in a predis genetically predisposed individual, if they're exposed to a viral uh, illness, it's a trigger for an immune, immune response. Um, it's fascinating, the, 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 uh, the white dot syndromes are fascinating because of the you know, variation in their severity and recovery. Uh, are there any other questions about mutants? So I hope that you know we got a couple of take-home messages. The white dot syndromes are interesting. Uh, we really don't know what causes them uh, yet, but we have learned a lot about them uh, clinically over the years um, in terms of the clinical descri descriptions. It is possible to separate them clinically based on their clinical description and their natural history, and more recently, <coughs> with the advent of multimodal imaging, particularly high definition OCT and OCTA, we. Um, can characterize them better. Um, <coughs> uh, I think a viral illness. <laughs> we can characterize them better. We um, are more <coughs> confident about uh, where the actual pathology is actually happening. Um, I, and this is particularly true in the case that <coughs> Marissa just showed where uh, it was previously thought that um, you know, Muse was a inflammation of the cordy capillaris, but clearly it shows it's a photoreceptor disease. Ampi is another, uh, and serpiginous are also um, diseases that uh, a multimodal imaging, particularly OCTA, has shown that, uh, that it is indeed probably a cordy capillary disease with secondary involvement of the uh, retinal pigment epithelium, uh, where things are happening. Um, the other <coughs> thing is that distinguishing them, uh, whether or not they're spec from the same disease, I'm certainly open to that. Uh, when we can figure out what causes them. But I think it's really important clinically to distinguish them because there are definitely disease-specific indications for treatment. So a patient with serpiginous or urchid needs to be treated with immunomodulation pretty much from the outset. Uh, a patient with mutants doesn't need treatment, so I, I would choose mutants okay, um, if I had a disease like this. Um, it's a little more gray with the pick and multifocal chloriditis. Uh, the other real interesting utility, I think, and some of the difficulties sometimes uh, in patients with multifocal choroiditis and, and PIC 
is trying to distinguish between what is an inflammatory lesion okay, in, in the uh, retinal pigment epithelium, what is an inflammatory choroidal neovascular membrane. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to distinguish that based on the fluorescent angiogram alone, because they're type 2 membranes. Um, they do leak, but you know, uh, so do uh, inflammatory lesions. Uh, and I think that OCT angiography may help us in distinguishing Thank you very much, and I thank my presenters who did a great job. Illustrating.